Hello. That was a, that was a a wave. Hello. Uh, I got I got there. You, you know. All right. Uh, you outnumber us. Uh, maybe tomorrow. Right. <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Thanks for coming. No. No. St. Patrick's Day. Um, I am wearing green because Paladino is an old Irish name, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. There we go. This week, our Deputy Secretary of State, John J. Sullivan, is in South Africa and Angola. His visit is focused on promoting U.S. trade and investment, as well as advancing peace and security. Today, in South Africa, the Deputy Secretary held meetings with a range of stakeholders, during which she discussed South Africa's business climate, IBM's investments in entrepreneurship and innovation in Johannesburg, and the value of U.S. government exchange programs. In addition, he will tour the Zola Community Health Center and meet with beneficiaries of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief Program. During his visit, the Deputy Secretary will also meet with South African government officials to discuss bilateral trade and regional multilateral priorities, including with respect to the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. In these meetings, the Deputy Secretary will stress the importance of prioritizing economic partnerships based on mutual respect that help African nations take control of their economic destinies. In Angola, Deputy Secretary Sullivan will meet with President Lorenzo to discuss a range of global economic and security issues. The Deputy Secretary will co-chair a session of the United States Angola Strategic Dialogue with Foreign Minister Augusto. They plan to discuss the ways for our partnership to grow in areas such as economic engagement, security cooperation, and development programs, as well as efforts to ensure humanitarian assistance reaches the Venezuelan people. While in Luanda, Deputy Secretary Sullivan will also deliver remarks on the administration's Africa strategy to members of the business community and meet with representatives from civil society, youth leaders, and the United States mission personnel to underscore the depth and breadth of the United States engagement in Africa. Hmm. We are focused. Um, I also want to highlight two important announcements that were made today by <coughs> Secretary Pompeo's Special Representative for Syria Engagement, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey. This was done at the third Brussels Conference on supporting the future of Syria and the region. Today, the United States announced more than $397 million in additional humanitarian assistance for the people of Syria as part of the United Nations Syria Response Plan. This reflects our commitment to providing critical life-saving support to any Syrian impacted by the conflict, no matter where they live, both inside Syria and vulnerable refugee communities in Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, Iraq, and Egypt. <laughs> U.S. humanitarian assistance is now more than $9.5 billion since the start of this crisis, and we appreciate all donors who have stepped up, and we encourage others to help meet the growing need as well. Ambassador Jeffrey also announced at the direction of the President, and subject to congressional approval, the United States' intention to provide additional $5 million to support the vital life-saving operations of the White Helmets in Syria and the United Nations International, Impartial, and Independent Mechanism, the Triple IM. The United States strongly supports the work of the White Helmets. They have saved more than 114,000 lives since the conflict began, including victims of Assad's vicious chemical weapons attacks, and we stand firmly with them against attempts to delegitimize their work. The Triple IM is charged with assisting the investigation and prosecution of persons responsible for the most serious crimes under international law committed in Syria 
since March 2011. We're, and we're proud to support these efforts. These contributions demonstrate the United States' commitment uh, and ongoing support for justice and accountability in Syria. And with that, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thanks, Robert. Can we uh, start with Venezuela um, briefly and the um, return or the departure of the remaining uh, American diplomats from Caracas? In the statement that the Secretary put out um, announcing that, that they had left, it ends with we, the sentence, we look forward to resuming our presence once the transition to democracy begins. When, in the administration's view, is the, what, does the transition to democracy begin? Uh, is that when Maduro leaves, when he accepts or agrees to new elections? Um, when, what, when does the transition to democracy begin? Yeah, hopefully soon. Um, well, and what is the trigger for the, not the, the date, although I note that you we, we, we will We will define it when we see it, um, and I, I'm not going to specify exactly how it looks, but... Um, so it's possible then that that diplomat that, that you could reopen or you know uh, restaff your your embassy uh, while Maduro remains de facto in power at least as you would, you would no as you, that's no, a not. hypothetical um, and uh, you know I'll I, I'll, I don't I'll, know I'll what your definition of hypothetical is. yeah you're saying because if I'm if not, you're saying if this no, were to happen fact, that's fact, that is no, the no. definition of a hypothetical actually uh, Robert, right except I didn't use the word if. <laughs> All right. How about this? Can you foresee a situation in which uh, U.S. diplomats return to Caracas while Maduro is still the um, what you would consider the de, de facto or the, is still running the government? Uh, not the word if. It does not exist in that sense. It's not a hypothetical. We are uh, looking forward to the day when they can return to witness firsthand um, transition to democracy. So I have a very hard time uh, with that formulation. But just to catch you up on where we, we are, um, all diplomats that had remained in Venezuela have now departed the country. Um, they were and they continue to be fully dedicated to the mission of supporting the Venezuelan people's democratic aspirations and desire to build a better future. They will now carry that mission forward from other locations. The United States remains firm in our resolve and support for the Venezuela people, the National Assembly, and interim President Juan Guaido. We look forward to returning our presence to witness firsthand Venezuela's transition to democracy. Michelle. Thanks. Um, how great is the State Department's concern that Maduro or his supporters might try to arrest Guaido at this point? What I would say is um, we hold former President Maduro and those who surround him fully responsible for the safety and welfare of interim President Guaido and his family. And it would be a terrible mistake for the illegitimate, illegitimate Maduro regime to arrest interim President Guaido. And it would provoke an immediate reaction from Venezuelans and the international community. Robert? Leslie. I have two questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit how the diplomats got out? Uh, there were reports that it was a military plane. Um, we've had U.S. officials say it wasn't. Um, can you just tell us, and what time? And number two, um, who have you appointed a protecting power or powers? Right. It, uh, I can confirm that it was a civilian charter. It was not a military plane. Um, and as far as an interim power goes, we're working to identify a country to act as our protecting power in order to provide uh, limited services to any remaining United States citizens in Venezuela. 
and we expect to make an announcement quite soon. So, uh, who's protecting the property? At, is there anybody protecting that property right now? Or um, and um, was part of the civilian charter also bringing out um, equipment and other things? Yes. Um, let's just say we had uh, we had things that weighed quite a bit uh, that would require a civilian charter plan. Right. <laughs> Is there a little bit more on Venezuela, please? <laughs> equipment. <laughs> or some of our equipment. Like, yeah, sure. Like, like, like Any what? more on, on Venezuela? Please, go ahead, Abby. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Wait, wait. Like, like what? Weighs a lot. Like desks? Equi not mean? quite. No, I'm not going to go into details. But we, we had, we had enough that... Enough that uh, United Airlines is not going to be happy with us. Please go ahead, Abby. Whatever. Can you speak a little bit about the Americans who are still there, American citizens, and what it is that the State Department is doing or suggesting as far as their own uh, efforts to leave the country? Right. Um, as far as American citizens uh, that remain in Venezuela go, we will hold former President Maduro and the Venezuelan military and security services directly responsible uh, for the safety and wel welfare of U.S. citizens in Venezuela. U.S. citizens residing in Venezuela or traveling to Venezuela or traveling in Venezuela should strongly consider um, departing Venezuela. We, there are limited commercial flights that remain available uh, just, and uh, you've, you saw our travel advisory that we updated uh, that was two days ago now we remain at level four with the with the with the strong warning do not travel that hasn't changed um, our embassy does not have is not able to provide consular services at the moment uh, as our personnel have departed and as as to Reuters' earlier question, we, we expect to be able to announce more details soon on um, what provisions we've been able to arrange. Venezuela. More on Venezuela? Yeah. Sure. But let's go FA, please. Thank you. Um, in the statement, the secretary said that these diplomats, they are going to continue to work from other locations. Mm -hmm. Are they going to work from Colombia, from Brazil? And if you are discussing this with these countries, and also when do you estimate that this work will resume, when they will continue working? Well, we have a Thank task you. force here in the State Department that is uh, operating pretty much around the clock and has been operating since the beginning of this. Many of these personnel will uh, join that, that effort. And as the special representative mentioned on Tuesday, um, much of his efforts that he is spearheading is benefiting from uh, a lot of the talent that we've had to, that has had to withdraw from Caracas. As far as where else and how else we are looking to effect change and, and continue to work on these issues, I'm not going to go, be able to go into detail on that effort, but there's a lot that remains to be done, and you know, for example, the United States continues to impose visa restrictions on corrupt individuals uh, who enable Maduro's theft of Venezuela's assets for their own personal gain. And we are applying this policy to numerous Maduro-aligned officials and their families. Since this Monday, this past Monday, March 11th, we have revoked 340 visas, 107 of which include visas of Maduro's former diplomats and their families. Sorry, 107 of which. And the 340 and since Monday, 107 of which include visas of Maduro's former diplomats and their families. This action brings the total number of revoked visas to more than 600 since late 2018. Additional visas are being considered for revocation. Uh, Robert, just before we leave Venezuela, can I, 
I'm still intrigued by what, what, what it is that weighs so much that you had to get out of the embassy. I mean, is it like office supplies or computers, or is it like, you know... Matt, I don't have details. Or, I, 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 I don't well, have can details. Can you find out? Because, I mean, I just think it's just kind of interesting. Anyway, the, and the, the other thing I just wanted to ask is, you know, when you say we will hold former President Maduro and the security services responsible for this, isn't that, when, when you say, former, when you insist on calling him former president, and then also say that he's responsible... Aren't you conceding that your effort to promote or to push um, Juan Guaido as the legitimate leader has has failed? Because you get you, you call this guy former president, and yet you still you accept that he has responsibility over, or or you insist that he has responsibility for. The safety and security of American citizens. He he's, he still has de facto control over uh, you know issuing orders to colectivos and the you know overall just complete deterioration of the situation that has taken place. Um, that deterioration, as as the secretary and the special representative has spoken about, it, the driving. And one of the, the driving forces why we, we, you know, we what, what it was no longer sustainable. Right. So you don't see that as a concession that your attempts to promote Guaido no. have, have, have come to naught so far. No. 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 Uh, we we take the opposite lesson. We are quite pleased at the uh, at the overall uh, global effort that that has been undertaken, and we are. Policy is going to continue to support democracy in Venezuela. We're going to continue to support the interim president, the only democratically elected institution in the country, the National Assembly. And we are going to continue on our policy of using sanctions and diplomatic pressure to, to pressure the illegitimate uh, regime to end. It's uh, to end. I'll stop there. Let's go to Washington Post. What's the status of the local staff there? Are they still employees? And do you have any concerns for their safety? The, the, our locally employed staff uh, continue to be employed by the United States government. They continue to receive their salaries. And they continue to work for us. Um, for security reasons, I'm not going to, to go much beyond that. Are you going to make any of uh, Jim Story's remarks uh, that were made before the flag was lowered? Are you going to make any of those remarks available to us? Yes, we are. OK. Please. Please, let's go ahead. Sure. Can you give us a readout of the secretary's meeting with Mr. Griffith today? I don't think we have that, do we? But I can talk about Yemen a little bit, if that would be of use. Um, OK. If you have any update on that and whether you uh, blame the Houthis, whether, it's a, you, if, whether you blame the Houthis for not implementing the Hodeida Agreement okay. that Mr. Uh, Griffith uh, criticized him for right. yesterday right. at the UN. So, the secretary is meeting with Mr. Griffiths, I believe, at 3 o'clock today, right? So I think that's right about now. So I don't have a readout. I don't know what time it is. At 1. Oh, is it 1? I apologize then. OK. Um, I don't have a readout yet to, 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 to provide. Can we get a readout? Uh, uh, as soon as we hope so. Can. Oh, so, yeah. We'll try to get that to you, OK? Um, our focus hasn't changed in Yemen. We're, we're focused on supporting a comprehensive political agreement that will end the conflict. So t towards that end, we are, we are, we continue to support the United Nations Special Envoy Martin Griffiths, and we encourage Yemenis to swiftly implement agreements that were made in Sweden, so that the political process uh, can move forward. Um, and uh, you had a question about. Who the Hodeida, okay. I mean, if the Houthis continue to mm. not implement it. And you're calling for them to swiftly. We, how, how we continue to urge all parties uh, to adhere to the commitments that they made in Sweden, particularly the ceasefire and the redeployment. Mm -hmm. 
of forces in Hudeda. We strongly support the UN Redeployment Coordination Committee as it works to implement the Hudeda Agreement and to translate momentum from Sweden into real de-escalation on the ground. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yesterday, Ambassador Kozak suggested that the term occupied carries legal parameters, uh, and the West Bank and Golan Heights were listed as geographically. We, we don't know what that means. I wanted to ask you, what is your official designation of the West Bank now, today? What is, how do you designate it? As we stated last year, we retitled uh, the Human Rights Report to refer to commonly used geographic names in the area that the report covers Israel, the Golan Heights, the West Bank, Gaza. And this, this is in line with our practices generally. I'm not talking about the human rights in particular report in particular, but what is your designation for the West Bank? I mean, you know, by dropping the term occupied, you are a signatory to Resolution 242. 373. So does that compromise the moral standing of the United States when it drops its commitment or its signature, actually, on these resolutions? Yeah. Our, our view on the status of Golan Heights, West Bank, Gaza Strip, that has not changed. Uh, and I don't have anything uh, to add beyond that. And one last question. Uh, last week on Friday, Mr. Jason Green, uh, Greenblatt, the envoy to the peace uh, process, whatever it is. He uh, spoke at the UN and basically sided with Israel on um, confiscating the tax money. Now, and he, in subsequent uh, tweets <coughs> and so on, he alluded to the Taylor Force uh, law that was passed here. But, you know, that pertains to American money. This money that Israel is taking is Palestinian money. And it is, you know, enshrined in agreements between the two sides, in the Paris Accord, in the Oslo Accord, so explain to us why, uh, uh, first, why do you support the, the Israeli decision? And second, isn't that a breach of agreement that you oversaw? As far as Mr. Greenblatt's words and tweets and whatnot, I would refer you to the White House. Uh, his policy. For the, I mean, he's not as far as the Taylor, I mean, we've, we have said clearly many times before that the United States condemns the abhorrent practice of the Palestinian Authority's payments to imprisoned terrorists and the families of terrorists. It's the Taylor Force Act uh, addresses this practice. That's why, that's why it's relevant. And by restricting um, United States economic assistance that directly benefits the Palestinian Authority until it ends those payments. So this is something the United States continues to press the Palestinian Authority on, to, dis to, to discontinue uh, this reprehensible program that incentivizes terrorism. We strongly urge the Palestinian Authority not to reward terrorist violence. Iraq. Iraq. We'll start Iraq. Go okay. ahead, Lori, please. Thank you. Let's see. So popular mobilization <laughs> forces figured prominently as abusers in your report yesterday on human rights in Iraq, particularly in the north. And Ayatollah Sistani said said that pretty much to uh, Iran's president yesterday as well when they met. So do you think security and stability can be regained in Iraq without addressing this problem? Or aren't the Sunni Arabs, as long as they're being subject to abuse by sectarian militia, going to keep turning to a group like ISIS, you know, just to get away from this abuse? I guess I'd point out, as the Human Rights Report itself uh, indicates, we are deeply concerned about any abuses committed by sectarian armed forces. Many of those armed groups are aligned with Iran, which shares in the blame for their abuses. 
and which has used those groups to undermine Iraq's security, stability, and sovereignty. Qasem Soleimani and his Quds force actively seek to use these armed groups to intimidate the Iraqi people and undermine the legit legitimate authority of Iraq's elected government. The deputy chief of the popular mobilization forces, Abu al-Muhandis, is on video declaring his loyalty not to Iraq and Iraq's duly elected leaders, but to Qasem Soleimani. And this disregard for Iraqi sovereignty undermines the will of the Iraqi people. Oh. Well, just on Anna Mohandas, who is a particularly nefarious character because he is indicted for the 1983 bombings of the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait, a long time ago, indicted for it. Would you consider issuing a criminal arrest warrant or doing something particular against Amla Hondas? I'm not going to preview uh, any, anything uh, today. I would just say that Iraq can achieve security and stability only if Iran respects Iraq's sovereignty and ceases to subvert the central government's ability to rein in these uh, ill-disciplined armed forces. Uh, Robert, on, uh, on the Iranian president uh, visit to Iraq, uh, he uh, uh, he met with the tribes leaders and he signed uh, several agreements with the Iraqi government. Uh, do you have any comment on uh, these agreements and how can they uh, how can they help the uh, U.S. sanctions on Iran? We respect Iraq's uh, sovereign right to conduct its foreign relations for the benefit of the Iraqi people. I guess we'd say we also, we, we're, we think it's a shame that Iraq's neighbors don't necessarily see it the same way. The Iranian regime speaks of cooperation with Iraq, but as the Secretary noted just yesterday, its actions are aimed at subverting Iraqi sovereignty, making Iraq dependent upon Iran, and turning Iran into a vassal state. turning Iraq into a vassal state. The Iraqis are a proud people. Uh, they value their independence and sovereignty. And they have long memories. <coughs> their skepticism about Iran's intentions is understandable. But they, Stop but that. they signed the agreements that might undermine the, the US sanctions on Iran. I haven't, I haven't seen that yet. Not, I'd have to I'd take a look. I don't want to speak on it. Rob, do you also respect Iran's sovereign right to conduct foreign policy the way it sees fit? Um, I, Iran's malign influence uh, is, is well noted. Uh, its, its lack of respect for the sovereignty of its neighbors is, is well demonstrated, and that is a, a malign influence that right. the United States will continue to, but do to you encounter. But believe that Iran has a sovereign right to conduct foreign policy? As, or is it only if their foreign policy is something that you don't object to? Uh, abs absolutely not. Uh, we're talking about... I, I just asked them, do they have a sovereign right to their own? We respect uh, each nation's right to conduct foreign policy, absolutely. Yeah. 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 We've, I already asked on you. What, Afghanistan. 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 I think we should probably do Afghanistan. Okay. Okay. Do we? Do we have communal Afghanistan? All right. Is, well, is there a question? What was the? Who wants to ask the question? <laughs> Connor. Connor, please, uh, let, let's go ahead. Thank you, Robert. Um, the Afghan National Security Advisor is in town and gave comments this morning that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, really blasting Special Representative Khalil Zad, uh, accusing him of weakening the Afghan government uh, so that he could one day become the viceroy, um, saying that the U.S. talks of the Taliban are the wrong approach and have undermined the government's legitimacy. Would you care to respond to that? To, to the comments themselves, we don't believe that they warrant a public response. Uh, but I would add that our Undersecretary for Political Affairs, David Hale, 
is meeting with him as of 20 minutes ago, 3 o'clock this afternoon, to communicate the United States government's displeasure. We remain in close consultation with President Ghani, with Chief Executive Abdullah, and other senior members of the Afghan government on all matters involving peace in Afghanistan. And at every available opportunity, often multiple times during a single trip abroad, Special Representative Khalil Azad has traveled to Kabul for updates and consultations. Khalil Azad and President Ghani also speak regularly by telephone. In addition, Ambassador Bass, our ambassador in Kabul, and his team, they're in touch with President Ghani on a near daily basis. So there is no lack of coordination. The follow up is uh, so do you still, does the US government still have um, confidence in the government of, of, um, of Ghani? And number two, um, if the Taliban is refusing to meet with the Afghan government, can you guarantee that there will be no troop pull out um, until that time? To the, to the first question, yes. Um, to the second question, an intra-Afghan dialogue must be a part of any final package. Such a dialogue must include the Taliban the Afghan government, and other Afghan stakeholders, including women and youth. Now, Special Representative Khalil Azad returned yesterday, and he's currently in consultations here at the State Department and around Washington, as well as meeting with representatives from other partner countries. And the last round of talks saw meaningful progress. We, we have moved to an agreement in draft on the, the first of the two core issues, specifically counter-terrorism assurances and troop withdrawal. And when the, the agreement in draft is finalized, the Taliban and an inclusive Afghan negotiating team that includes the Afghan government and other Afghans will begin their work on the other two core issues, intra-Afghan negotiations and a political settlement and a comprehensive ceasefire. Okay, sure, Francesca. On, on one question is, uh, is Ambassador Khalid is that part of the meeting with uh, David Hale and, uh, and Afghan NSA. I, I don't have that information. And the other one is, uh, have you got any acknowledgement or agreement from the Taliban that some kind of inter-Afghan um, uh, talks will happen after there is an agreement on the two first pillars? I'm not going to be able to go um, get into any more details on the, the current negotiations as they're private, um, they're ongoing, and we want to give the parties time to work out these issues so, in progress. So when you and Ambassador Kelly that say after there's an agreement uh, on the two first pillars, there will be talks, interact and talk, it's your point of view, it's not an agreed point of view with the Taliban. I, I would say that uh, that when the agreement on the draft is finalized, the Taliban and an inclusive uh, Afghan negotiating team that includes the Afghan government and other Afghans, at that point, they will begin to work on the other two core issues. And the Taliban agreed to that? Uh, we, there, there's no uh, agreement until we have a, a, a full agreement, and we will continue to work towards that, okay? Another, wait, 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 wait. I call on you, Abby. Let's go, Lala, please. 
before going public with his comments on the Taliban talks, did <coughs> government of Afghanistan has reached out to uh, to U.S. the State Department about his views on the talks? <coughs> it looks like it's quite opposite. It doesn't want talks with the Taliban to happen. Study at Hudson Institute, um, uh, NSA Mohib said the Taliban and terrorism have the same DNA. Are the same DNA? Uh, as I as I said earlier, I'm not going to. We don't, I don't, we don't believe that the comments that were made warrant a public response. Um, and we are, we are in discussions with the, the government, uh, at, you know, to express our displeasure, please. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay. Um, after previous rounds of talks, though, uh, Ambassador Khalilzad has gone directly to Kabul. He didn't do that this time. Was there a particular reason why he didn't go to consult the Afghan government immediately afterwards? Both Special Representative um, Khalil Zad and Ambassador Bass are in close consultation with President Ghani, um, Chief Executive Abdullah, and other senior members of the Afghan government, as well as you know the country's broader political leadership on all matters involving uh, peace in Afghanistan. And in, in our talks with the Taliban representatives, we are getting to a place where the Taliban and an inclusive uh, Afghan negotiating team can come together to discuss a political settlement that ends the conflict. Uh, this this intra-Afghan dialogue must be part of any final package and such a dialogue must include the Taliban, the Afghan government, and other Afghan stakeholders. So we are in uh, continuous daily coordination. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll stop there. Can I, can All right. One, uh, one last question. So yeah. please, yeah. right here. Go ahead, Cindy. Go ahead. Yeah, thank one you. One more just follow to that. Has the U.S. received assurances from other members of the Afghan government that the uh, National Security Advisors opinion that's not representative of the full Afghan government? Well, as I said earlier, we're confident in our, our Afghan government partner. Please. Well, yes, well, let's go ahead. And, so you don't think that he represents the Afghan uh, I, government? I did, I did not say that at all. We remain confident in our Afghan uh, okay, government well, partner. Uh, and, I, and, we, and, I, and I've already uh, ex ex explained that there is a meeting going on as we speak, yes, and we'll I, provide a readout. On, oh, on, we, I, well, I hope so. I don't know. Well, <laughs> I hope so. Okay. I'll try. I'm going to try. I'll try. Danny, please go ahead. Okay. Oh, you're so nice. Well, well I don't know. <laughs> Can you give us uh, uh, on the readout of uh, working group meeting between uh, Wang, Alex Wang, as you said, exactly, and uh, South Korean delegations today? Okay. You are referring to our Deputy Assistant Secretary, yeah, Alex. Yeah. Um, United States, this is uh, the United States Republic of Korea Working Group. Yeah. Um, they they held a working group meeting uh, earlier today here in Washington. Mm -hmm. This is something that is, uh, that is happening routinely now, regularly. Uh, it's part of our comprehensive and close coordination uh, over North Korea. During the meeting, the United States and the Republic of Korea shared updates on efforts to achieve our shared goal of a final fully verified denuclearization, including through the implementation of United Nations Security Council resolutions. The two sides reaffirmed their commitment to continue regularly hosting these, these, these close, uh, these consultations and coordinations uh, as alliance partners. And you saw as well, I'm sure, that uh, Special Representative Began is in New York uh, today. Um, and I, I the, believe that was at 3 o'clock. Um, and you know, he's meeting with uh, the permanent representatives there. Uh, and they are talking um, about the summit. As he's providing a briefing on the summit and uh, 
what we are doing, the world is doing to ensure the full uh, implementation of the United Nations Security Council's re resolutions on this matter. Not, not, not Also, New York. both sides discussed about the uh, sanctions lift, I mean, U.S. <laughs> sanctions lift against North Korea. They didn't discuss about these issues? He, their briefing, uh, he's providing a briefing, uh, mm -hmm. a readout of, of what transpired mm -hmm. um, at the recent summit in Hanoi mm -hmm. and um, what we're doing to ensure uh, continued uh, enforcement of United Nations Security Council resolutions. Thanks. Great. On, on the Afghanistan issue, you said that there was no lack of coordination. I'm, I'm assuming you mean with the Afghan government. Correct. The NSA is claiming that they're getting information by tweets and that they're kept in the dark. Do, do you then dispute what he's saying? I mean, are you sharing, is the State Department sharing all of its information with him, or are, are they getting some of the news from tweets? We are extremely, uh, in extremely close coordination uh, with President Ghani um, and other Afghan leaders uh, on a, uh, in a variety of ways, on the telephone, in person, and on a daily basis. And that's going to continue. Please. Lalit, one more. Please go ahead. I have one, one question on China. Uh, China has, has a strong objections to the remarks made by Secretary Pompeo yesterday about its human rights violation. China is saying that US would come out of its Cold War mentality and is also accusing US of interfering in, in its internal affairs. How do you see that reaction? Uh, we, we spoke about this at. Uh, length yesterday. Um, this is something that we're going to continue to speak out about. This really is, uh, you know, an appalling uh, situation uh, that, that's ongoing. And we're alarmed, um, frankly, that there's over a million people uh, at least being detained. Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs, other members of um, Muslim minority groups in these internment camps. We will continue to call on um, China to end these, these policies and to free these people who have been arbitrarily detained. Secretary Pompeo was, was certainly clear yesterday, and he was certainly clear on this issue when his Chinese counterpart um, visited Washington for the diplomatic and security dialogue that we held a few months ago. We will, uh, I'll, I'll echo the government of Turkey's recent statement on this matter in which they, they called this a, a great uh, shame for humanity. It's well said. We are committed to promoting accountability for those who are committing these violations and considering targeted sanctions as well. Targeted measures as well. And I also point out that uh, on March 13th, the United States co-hosted an event with Canada, the Netherlands, Germany, United Kingdom, at the United Nations in Geneva to together continue to raise awareness on this issue. We'll continue to do so, and we, we also strongly encourage the United Nations and the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, to make these abuses a priority. So you said that you, you said that you you said that you support the government of Turkey's statements of concern and complaint about Chinese treatment of 
of religious minorities. But I never heard you support the government of Turkey's complaints and concerns about um, the Palestinians. Is there? A, do you just you just pick and choose which uh, Turkish position you you you, you want to uh, you want to support? Turkish government's February 9th statement was, um, was well said, in which they stated that the reintroduction of internment camps in the 21st century and the policy of systemic assimilation against the Uyghur Turks carried out by the authorities of China is a great shame for humanity. That is... Um, well said. Right. You don't agree with Turkey on everything, right? Uh, of course not. We, okay. we, we, we tend not to agree with, uh, on everything with everyone. That is true. That's good. And so, let, I'm, I'm so, okay, last question. Please, go, you got me. Go ahead. He said that the uh, troops in Iraq would be uh, slightly less than the number. And uh, President Trump said in his last visit that uh, they, that you will remain the troops there to watch Iran. Is there any change in the strategy? Uh, no change uh, uh, in our strategy, and I haven't seen General Dumford's comments. But for for anything further on that, I'd re I would refer to the Department of Defense as well. well we're going to stop there, guys. The Thanks, to guys. Just a